Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, you're here with us at the Policy Panchayat when we have conversations with policy professionals from across the field on their experience and journeys and on the policy space in general. Today we are joined by Sharan who's had a very long and amazing career, not just as a policy consultant, but also as someone who's worked with MPs, with politicians, with the government in the past. And to set some premise today, we are discussing what is definitely the most common questions I've received and I'm I'm sure Shang will concur, which is how does the policy making process work? What are the steps involved, right? Uh, like all the individual steps there. And while discussing each of these steps in detail, what we will try and do is unpack the kind of skills and roles and jobs that each of these steps has so that you can figure out that, you know, where is it that you might be the best fit at, right? At least that's what we try and attempt here. Uh, as always, if you have you know, any inputs, any feedback, anything we could do differently, or more importantly, anything you would want us to consider for the next video, any guess you want us to get, please drop it in the comments. But without any further ado, we'll just get started. Sharan, why don't you, uh, firstly, thank you so much for taking out the time. Would you like to just give us an overview of these six processes for any policy to be formulated and implemented in India, right? Like the whole policy making process in general, and maybe in brief about each of these before we delve into in depth with each, uh, all six of this. Got it. Food. So let me start off by, yeah, like you mentioned, there are six parts to it, or that's at least my framing of it. Yeah. Uh, some people, I think in a more academic framing has five, but I've broken research and advocacy into two parts because I think the skill set required is very different. So essentially, uh, the policy making process starts with research, which yeah. means it starts with the identification of a need. Then that need is basically uh, communicated to the government. After it's communicated to the government, the government starts taking action on it uh, and designing a policy. Okay. After that policy is designed, it's implemented. And then after it's implemented, it goes into an oversight function. Basically, there has to be someone making the government accountable. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's in a nutshell. But let me just go a little deeper into each one of these. Right. Yeah. So, for example, let's start with research because that's the first uh, uh, starting point of policy, if you ask me. Yeah. The policy process begins with the observation or identification of a problem that requires the intervention of the government to be solved. Absolutely. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically how you can sum up why there is a need for research and why it starts over there. Yeah. Now, research, of course, means that it can be a casual need. It can be... Uh, identified from political lens, it can be identified from an ideological lens, but essentially it's identified in some way or shape or form. Yeah. And then what happens is you try and codify that. Now there are a lot of organizations working here. Mm. Now, and research can happen from three different sect uh, sections of society. G the government has uh, research organizations, DRDO, ISRO, they're basically research organizations. Yeah. ISRO also does a lot of now implementation, of course, but it was essentially space research organization. Yeah. Uh, there are political stakeholders over here. Yeah. Uh, officers or members of parliament, research wings of political parties. They yeah. also basically do that. Then there's the private sector. The private sector includes research organizations. It includes industry associations. Law firms are policy teams that look at research very technically from a legal lens only. Yeah. And yeah. then you have the uh, you have civil society, which is basically your universities and your think tanks. So yeah. academia and think tanks are involved in this process as well. Yeah. Now, once research is codified, sorry, my dog's going mad. Give me a minute. So, so coming to the next phase, which is now advocacy. Yeah. Of course, research has its place and it's essential. It creates the backbone of policy making. Yeah. But what happens is you and I know, and I'm sure so many people, everyone in policy knows this, that you can write the best paper, but it isn't going to do anything with the government, right? Yeah. Uh, everyone will be like, oh, great paper, I appreciate it. They put it on their shelves and that's basically it. So essentially now you've identified a need. Now you need to create hype around that need. You basically need to be like, kind of take that need and really put a spotlight on it or kind of blow it up, right? And that's what advocacy and communications really does. You have to really get the government to move on this need now. And that's essentially what uh, public policy consulting firms do. That's what, well, you'd be best to answer this, but like in-house teams of corporates that have public policy, corporate affairs, all of these teams basically do this. Yeah. Industry associations do this for your entire spectrum of basically industry as well. There are not profits over here as well, right? Mm. Think tanks, they do research, 
but they also do a little bit of advocacy like they'll have a few conferences to try and push their messaging and their research material out yeah uh CSOs basically which is civil society organizations labor unions they've been very influential in advocacy yeah a lot of uh, employment rights came from like way back then as well uh you could say either henry ford started or the labor union that's another debate for another time i'm not getting into that uh then who else is over here let me think for a second maybe political for- parties yeah political parties politicians members of parliament members of parliament basically are advocating for the rights of their constituents political parties essentially i consider advocacy anything that shapes the public narrative towards policy change and that's what politicians literally do they are trying to shape public opinion which yeah. means they're changing people's minds about the conversation towards a policy change that they're hoping will that they'll be the ones who are going to implement those policy changes yeah so essentially that is advocacy in a nutshell you take the research material and then you find a way to either sensitize the public about it you sensitize the government stakeholders about it you create consensus you create formo and then you kind of get things rolling over here and and right? there the whole idea is that how do we overcome political inertia right get this moving yeah. make a case exactly that's what politicians really want to do you you want to create political resonance actually i'd say yeah. inertia is one thing and resonance is basically like the actually resonance is how you kind of overcome you know she yeah. asked me yeah. there's no yeah. movement then you're like oh but we align with your ideas these are moving towards your ideas right and yeah. then people are like all right okay this actually makes a lot of sense yeah uh on, yeah on to the next thing right so of course there are those instances when the government commissions a research right but mm-hmm. keeping those cases aside next step is when the government becomes involved for the first time which is policy design can you put that way yeah. right uh the whole government machinery comes into this so if you could tell us briefly about what is that you know in terms of what the stakeholders are and what that one movement is like so the other two the first two phases can start from the private sector but essentially the next phase is government driven yeah. it is when the government basically is like all right okay everyone saying that we have to do something there's a clear signal that there is some sort of need or some side of gap in society and it's our job to fix that but now the government will always now they are kind of stretched on capacity right you can't have the bureaucrat doing everything but so what they do is there's a lot of technical stuff as well bureaucrats are generalists essentially right you can be in the uh, agricultural ministry one day you will be in the industries ministry one day by the end of your career you're more or less found your niche in a few industries but you can be transferred around so they're generalists now there's a lot of technical knowledge that they might need they may need technical support and that's where they get in consultants for that part right consultants will be have that technical knowledge and help them create those policies and they create those policies basically by getting everyone together towards that so for example what will end up happening is you will have the bureaucrat they are uh, the bureaucrats of the government they'll get uh, the advisors on board the advisors will work to commission reports they'll get everybody from industry together for consultation by the way advocacy is still continuing here this is part of the process yeah uh they might get an expert committee also the government will like for example technical issue like plastic waste management there are multiple this things like what should be the should be 15 i think it was microns if i remember the measurement correctly or should be 100 or 10 or 5 yeah you and i would never be able to answer these things right so that's why you need the specialists over here the other kind of players over here and the other roles outside of bureaucracy that are available over here are with your young professionals programs a lot of the different ministries are doing that these days yeah and essentially now that the policy let's say it's formed it we've come to a conclusion that this everything that needed to happen has happened we yeah. move into implementation now uh so now we come to basically policy implementation or execution uh so we assume now that the policy has received whatever sanction it required and advocacy also kind of ends here because now everything's in motion right Yeah. There are odd cases, but I'm not going to cover. The idea is to give you a nutshell of how it generally works. There are always outliers to this process. Yeah. Implementation is like I we were saying, right? There's a lot of technical expertise that the government has, and the second is there's a lot of human capa- uh, capital constraints. You yeah. can't expect people to be doing everything and managing everything. So they get a lot of support as much support as they can. Uh, which is where they get again the same kind of consultants and project management units, basically. so these will be companies that will come in and be like all right this scheme will manage the delivery in abc format and they kind of execute on that tenders are given uh, contracts or services are basically created basically for this purpose 
Uh, besides bureaucracy and these PF news, a lot of governments have started this. They've tried to get young people involved in policy, yeah. right? All of the fellowships. Uh, yeah. CMGGA, Maharashtra Chief Ministers, I don't know, is it still a thing? No. No, it isn't. Oh. Telangana Innovation, Punjab District Development Associates. Yeah. I don't know. You have a full list of them. PPI has, I'm sure, in one of the newsletters, it would have come. If it hasn't, please subscribe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, essentially, the other thing that ends up happening over here is that the uh, government really relies on the development sector to try and help them push out a lot of the, uh, the things. Yeah. Because essentially, the development sector also has a lot of program management and program execution capacity. Yeah. And they're also trying to look towards similar aims, right? They're trying to plug gaps in society. Now, they might have different ideological lenses of what those gaps are, but yeah. to a certain degree, they remain the same. Like, hey, we want to improve healthcare. Now, you may have a different idea of how and where and what, but if someone's coming and saying, hey, can you help us improve healthcare and you're doing that, and they're also like, these are this is the working model, you'll be like, all right, fine, we can figure out a way to do this, right? And yeah. essentially, that's how they support them. I'm not going to get into the development sector stuff right now. Uh, you can check the handbook for that, basically. Uh, lastly, oversight. Yep. After everything's happening, once it's being executed, all these tenders are being given out. Basically, you need to figure out, all right, where's the money going? Are we getting results? And that's basically where parliament kind of steps in. That's their job. That's what standing committees essentially do. And I think there's standing committees at the state level as well. They yep. kind of overlook this. There are committees within the government as well that exist. So yeah, so I was coming. So yeah, and at the state level also, you have, I don't know if they call standing committees, but there are certain committees to overlook certain, the functioning of different departments as well. Yep. Over and above that, of course, you have RTIs, CSOs working over there, company, organizations like Janagra that work, focus very specifically on urban governance and do a lot for Bangalore. They're like, we want to make sure that we're doing oversight over what's happening in the city. And a lot of people do that as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, why don't you just walk us through, yes. I think, the six steps that you have shared yeah. for the policy making process. Yeah, so let me just start with this. Uh, of course, I mean, like, you know, everyone always these days wants to break into policy. So the yeah. idea over here through this session is to give you that, okay, you know, policy is a broad space. It isn't just one kind of role. And I think, like you said, the best way to break it down is by explaining the entire policy making process. But now we can probably jump into each vertical a little more closely, I think. So, Yash, do you want to start with research or should I start with research? Uh, but, uh, and this is a misconception that I, I would, you know, like to address at this stage, even before we begin. A lot of people think of policy research as this, uh, most commonly that, you know, this is some sort of a secondary survey of, you know, of the existing literature that we have of, uh, okay, maybe we can make policy recommendations or, you know, uh, how one thing flows from another. But but the kind of research that we're dealing with here, and Shang, please add to it and correct me if I'm wrong, is more of bottoms up in the sense, okay, this policy change is needed. Maybe some of this also flows from advocacy that, you know, uh, that this is, this is the kind of change we are advocating for. And this is the kind of change that the needs of policy that needs to be brought in. Uh, if you mm -hmm. could walk us through the whole policy research process, the space as you've seen it and you know how people could participate. Right. So, I mean, I haven't technically worked in research, so I don't know the depth of it, but I do understand how it kind of goes about right. now. In general, it can start off very simply, right? Like you look out of your window, you know that, okay, there are certain problems in society, right? You observe a need, essentially. You're like, okay, but that's a casual observation. And now you have to really make research of it. No one's going to look at a casual observation and be like, oh, we should change the policies of the country based on this, right? Uh, there needs to be some literature behind it. Yeah. And essentially, that's what research does, right? You figure out how do you quantify this, or in certain cases, you use qualitative methods, you might use ethnographic studies to try and understand the problem. You want to understand it sometimes just in terms of numbers, sometimes in terms of different perspectives on the problem. And that's essentially what research does. Uh, and that's where academia also kind of lies, right? They create the bulk of knowledge from which policies are also made. Right. Uh, think tanks, essentially, I think if I had to say what they do, they really bridge the Gap between, gap between academic knowledge, which might be technical knowledge. So yeah. for example, in energy, it could be someone's written about new storage systems and technologies that are coming up. Yeah. But it's the yeah. think tanks who really talk about how this could affect, how the policies can be changed according to this and how we should transition as a country, mm. right? Mm. Uh, so those are two types of roles. Yes, there's academia, there's think tanks. Uh, even political parties do research essentially, but they do it from a very different lens, right? 
they aren't necessarily looking at it from the lens from they are actually looking at it from their own philosophical lens of what policy should look like yeah and then they find the kind of right kind of research to back up those kind of claims right uh so what bjp might have identified as a problem in society uh, the congress might not so their research might look very different but they both do research from a philosophical basis essentially right yeah uh, i think economic research also kind of lies over here right because you're basically taking data and you're trying to understand how to analyze it and then that analysis leads to policy change uh research organizations outline india jpal they do a lot of this yeah. jpal also does other stuff across the spectrum but i think primarily they do a lot of like research over here they do a bit of oversight also because they kind of see on the ground how the policies are tested but that's something we'll get to later uh that's very helpful sharan and this is you know exactly what we were discussing earlier that it's essentially the identification of a need for a change of a legislative or, or change at a policy level and that's where research comes in to in a sense validate if there is a need for that change or not and then rest of the steps follow uh speaking of rest of the steps right uh next would be advocacy closely linked to research but i would say one of the most underrated uh parts of the whole process so and especially as as someone who's had you know a long career in this and i have also worked in zara to jump into this but what does policy advocacy look like and how does this form a part of this larger puzzle here? yeah so uh just before i jump into that i'd say one more thing i wanted to add on research which is basically what exactly are the skills that you require for research yeah. right yeah. Uh, depending on the type of research it could be qualitative it could be quantitative but you need to understand how the design process of creating the data collection methods comes in how do you make sure you're collecting the right kind of data how you analyzing it and then you require a certain amount of communication skill because you need to be able to put that into words yeah. or and represent your views in conferences and stuff yeah uh But yeah, as you and I both know, Yash, uh, research is important. It creates the backbone of policy change, but it isn't something that necessarily moves the needle on it. Yeah. Uh, you can write the best report in the world. You can write have the most coherent views, but essentially, unless you turn it, unless you're able to communicate it to the right people and create, uh, make that problem known or make yeah. sure that it's seen as a uh, something that needs to be fixed. there isn't really going to be any change knowledge is such and that yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's literally what both of us our jobs kind of are we have to figure out take that body of research and then find a way to advocate for the change that happens yeah so essentially what we're doing is while yes we'll also be doing a little bit of research over here it'll be a lot of secondary research it might be primary research but it may not be codified there might be intelligence gathering or understanding the gaps based on reading a lot of this understanding the gaps speaking to people knowing what kind of policies are required and yes. then managing to communicate the right things to the government uh communication of course can be through media it can be through a part uh, through building your relationship up with the government so essentially you want to build trust over here yes. and then i think above, over and above trust you want to be saying the right kind of things and that's essentially what i think advocacy is about but yeah i've seen it from the consulting side of the table maybe you have a different view from the inside of the corporates as well uh not necessarily that i mean this is not something that you know i look after in in my day job but uh from whatever experience i've had with advocacy totally agree with you sharan that really helps make the case for a policy change and one thing i realized that just given how interlinked politics and policy are unless mm-hmm. and until there's that base level social agreement that there needs to be this sort of a change it won't come to fruition no matter how good and accurate your research is or how sound and sensible its basic tenets are so again very underrated in that sense that if you got your policy advocacy in point that's the only way that you can actually get this large wheel rolling and things moving especially in a space like india that how do you convey the urgency and necessity of policy change how do you communicate that to a government or any other stakeholder right so that they at least start thinking about formulating the policy so to speak speaking of formulating right uh we we know that the basics here look like this right that once the government takes cognizance of not just the research that we have shared and communicated but the advocacy we have done right build a case so to speak uh the machinery moves to create a policy so to speak right that how do you put that whole thing into motion so what does that look like like if if there's someone you know who wants to be in policy formulation number one what does it look like but also in terms of skills what is that you would suggest for someone 
in this paper. Okay. So if the last two parts of what we spoke about could be started from the private sector and sometimes generally are, sometimes they start from the politicians themselves because essentially what a politician is doing, they are trying to affect society through yeah. conversation. They're trying to shape the public conversation and trying to say that we are the ones who can uh, affect change towards a certain idea, right? Yeah. They're saying this is a problem, we are the people who will solve the problem and then they try getting themselves elected. Uh, MPs also kind of do this, right? Like a large part of their job is kind of advocating for their constituents in parliament, essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. But putting uh, advocacy aside now and moving to uh, formulation. So let's assume that this process has gone smoothly, that you've said the right kind of things, the government's like, all right, you know what, this is a challenge and we really need to take this up and think about this a little more deeply. Uh, while the other two parts could happen from the private sector, this is essentially from now on, here on, the government kind of owns the process of policy making, right? So it is the bureaucrats and the ministers who are essentially the key uh, stakeholders over here. While the other stakeholders do play a, a role over here, but they may not, they play more of a recommendary role and advisory role. Yeah. They aren't essentially the people who are decision makers over here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what ends up happening in the formulation process, and there can be a few variations here and there, is that, uh, so the government has uh, consultants who they help them in the process of uh, formulation. Yep. So the government advisory teams of, let's say, KPMG, the big four, basically, yep. all basically do this. They work with the government to try and create a structure for the policies that they'll be working on. So right. assume it's a tourism sector policy, right? Yep. They'll be the ones who will be commissioning the re government's own research on this matter. Yep. Uh, so for example, now, of course, the government's heard about this need from the private sector and all, but they'll be like, all right, you know, there are too many uh, vested interests here, obviously. So they're like, we need to figure out, uh, do I own independent research to understand exactly what the situation is? Yeah. So they'll do that. Then they'll get all the stakeholders in the room also. Like, again, taking the example of tourism, it might be like the big players, like uh, make my trip and all, there'll be the hotel people, there'll be the restaurant people, and they'll be like, all right, we're trying to come up with this. How do we make this holistic? So they'll take their opinions in, and then they'll figure out, all right, this is how this should shape so that everybody, so essentially what you're trying to always do is create a situation where everybody wins, right? That would be an ideal situation. Yeah. Politics obviously does come in here where you will be like, all right, this group is going to get a little more advantage because I like that. But essentially, uh, ideally that won't happen. And yeah, that's essentially what the role of formulation is. And the other kind of roles, like, of course, you can go and do your civil services, you can get into bureaucracy. I think there are other roles as well, like young professionals, essentially. Yeah. Uh, I've had the chance to speak to a few over the last month. Yeah. And when I was speaking to them, they're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I do a lot of formulation. I always assume they did a little more implementation. But they were like, yeah, we do a lot of formulation as well. So I think essentially those, that's what happens over here. Of course, I haven't sat on that side of the table, but I still have a fair sense because I've interacted with a lot of people over there. Uh, I just have to ask this from one formal lamp to another. What the parliament does, of course, that's more on the execution side. But would you say that something like what standing committees do, that's yeah. on the formulation side of things as well? I, in a sense, sometimes, but I also think standing committees do two types of things. Yes, laws go through them for vetting. So yes, they're involved in that. So I think members of parliament actually work across the spectrum, right? Yeah. They have their own research offices. Yeah. They advocate for their constituents. Essentially in design, in design of formulation, they, if it's a law, they're the ones who have like the, they have to give a stamp of approval for something to pass as well, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think the standing committee does two things. It does oversight also, because if they, they really look at the functioning of every ministry, right? They're looking at, are you people putting your funds to the right place? Are the right kind of things happening? And of course, before laws come out or before they're tabled before the parliament, some of them come over here to just for vetting or like certain different operations come over here. Yeah. So I'd say they do more of oversight and maybe a little bit over here, the standing committees. But I didn't do so much standing committee work, so I'm not the right person to, to answer this question. Got it. Uh, speaking of execution, right? Uh, now this is where the government has already done its like had had its research inputs uh advocates have built their case for the law the government has also done its like work right it has formulated the policy and it wants to implement it or execute it what does that process look like 
All right. So yeah. So the implementation, uh, yes. Uh, what ends up happening is there are different levels of implementation, right? Uh, there's oversight that'll happen at the central level. They need to figure out that they need to get processes in place and to make sure things are working properly smoothly. At the state level, a lot of the implementation actually ends up happening at the state level because that's where the capacity really lies to try and push things out. Or at the district level, if it's one of the grassroots level schemes, right? Uh, but essentially what ends up happening in a lot of cases is that the government is kind of stretched for human capacity, right? Uh, and technical capacity. That's also why they had consultants in that formulations to the phase. Yeah. So for example, on electric vehicles, they may be like, okay, we might hire some people but then it's hard for them to make sure that people sustain, stay in the government, stay for the entire life cycle of things, which yeah. is why they get those KPMG and all in. It makes their cost, it essentially reduces the cost on them, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And essentially, these people, the KPMG and all, and maybe a few other players are seen, uh, end up also doing a lot of project management over here. So they will help project manage the implementation of uh, policies on the ground. But over and above that, I think this is maybe my classification. I don't think, I don't know how many people will agree with this, but I think this is in implementation is also where the other side of things lie, which is the social impact sector, which a lot of people ask about. Yeah. Uh, and I try to put them over here because the government leans on them a lot for uh, making sure things reach the ground. So even at the district level, they may not have the capacity to go door to door and make sure things are happening. Or even in education, right? They don't may not have the capacity to deliver education at scale. Actually, education they now have to because of RTE, but other stuff, you get what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so here's where they really lean upon the development sector to try and get a lot of those things happening. And the development sector also essentially is looking at the same aims. They're like looking at trying to uh, create social upliftment, right? Essentially. Now they might have different ideas of what that looks like, yeah. but they are kind of working in consonance. So for example, I can tell you that and I've been in one of these meetings where uh, I've seen a government be like, speak to people, call up people in Tata Trust and be like, hey, we really need your help. We're coming up with this program in this district. And we know that you're present here. So we're just calling you and we're expecting or hoping that you'll support us in delivery. And they were just like, yeah, sure. This makes sense. We like what you're doing. Similarly, I think with in Alibag, there is a foundation run by an other very influential person who probably does the same thing. So yeah, that's why I put the social impact sector around here as well. Gotcha, gotcha. And this is when when we say policy implementation. Uh, of course, you know, just stepping back a bit, Sharon. So of course, yeah. like the parliament passes a law, for example, right? Uh, there's delegated legislation. If state legislators are involved, then they get in, and all of that happens, becomes a law of the land. For example, something like midday meals. If I have to take a very practical view of it, right? And the, and the, government has, the government has mandated that, you know, all mm. school going children should be provided with midday meals there. How does that work though? Like in the sense, now it's law of the land, like where do, and the resources have been provided. Is there a way that it decided, it's decided that, you know, it'll go through district magistrates or Anganwaris, like where are these decisions made? It's not in the parliament for sure, right? So this isn't in the parliament. This happens in the bureaucracy. Right. Um, where exactly is a good question. Now, I don't know the nitty gritties of this. So I'm going to guess an answer. And I yeah. want to make this clear for anyone who's viewing this, that this is not certainty, but this is rationally probably it. Yeah. Uh, so every there's a work allocation within governments, right? And every government, there's a sp every specific officer has certain work allocations. So when a new thing comes out, what happens is someone will be given charge and said, Hey, this is in your bucket. Now, yeah. now it's up to that person to figure out how that is going to end up getting delivered. Now, when you're talking about midday uh, schemes, that's something where it was a central government thing, but then the state governments have to push it out. Yeah. Now, if I was talking about, let's say something in um, da, 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 tourism, which let's say they're like, we want to create a new campaign of incredible India too. Yeah. Then that can be managed by the central government only, right? Then there's an officer over here who takes charge. Otherwise, what happens is then there are people, they are a kind of, there are always people who are coordinating with each state. There are some people who are like, they'll be given three or four states each and they, it's their job to try and coordinate with them. So they'll probably be in touch with them. They'll understand what kind of budgetary challenges they're having also. And yeah. it happens from, then the state might be uh, within them. They have to structure it out. They'll have to, well, they have the district administration under them. So it's much easier for them over there. 
and yeah i and then there's c capacities like i said right for midday meal is let's uh, take that as an example they've gone to akshay patra and akshay patra helps them in a decent way in a lot of states from maybe not a lot of states but to a large extent as far as i know yeah. i am not certain exactly how much they do but i keep hearing their name so i'm sure it's quite a bit uh, awesome this is a very helpful also yeah. thanks sharan just just building on from policy implementation slash uh, execution uh, one of the most important parts again uh, although not not that discussed right which is evaluation of the policy how is it working right and and also oversight of this larger system that we have uh, what are some some of the nuances there right and what what does that process look like to you so i think uh, both of us have worked in this right we both worked with mps that's literally the job of an mp is advocating for your constituents yeah. making sure the things are working also they do a bit of implementation in their constituency but it's also largely oversight right that's a parliamentary yeah. function yeah essentially uh, government has been divided so it's a parliamentary function and that's the role members of parliament play that's what standing committees also do to a large extent yeah. uh over and above that there are government agencies specifically created for this purpose as well right yeah. i mean you look at the ncb uh cag uh very influential body maybe i at one point at least uh yeah. the cvc also basically does that right and here's where you have i think and you'll be able to give a little more insight on this on the stuff that happens here but that's largely the role of media right it's the fourth pillar of democracy uh essentially the media is supposed to be a watchdog of the government which means it's supposed to have oversight half the scams that come out are basically media journalists going around and really figuring out what's wrong with the policies and yep. what's going on yeah so i'd say that also kind of falls over here and then last year i think they we've created like in the last 10 or maybe 20 years we've created a few instruments that help civil society also have oversight right yeah. so the rti is a brilliant tool for oversight you may not be able to figure everything out but you can get data to try and understand what's really happening behind the scenes there will be stonewalling there but at least that mechanism has been created yeah so yeah. yeah i think that kind of sums it up you can probably jump in the media right now on on that i would say shank that it's very interesting that you highlight this because in my understanding the role of media also start, adds to the very first step of what we have been discussing today which is research as well to a very small mm. extent but advocacy to a large extent as well right i remember uh, i don't remember exactly which journalist or publication was this but she had highlighted some some serious lapses with this whole uh, jan oshadi program right it's a great initiative but uh, some lapses at the implementation of getting indians access to cheap and affordable medicines and from there mm-hmm. there was you know the the human and human client something was taken up so media does help keep some of these institutions in check right by bringing out wherever the lapses are right whatever is not working through the fourth pillar of democracy but also when journalists go on the ground to report in a sense they are fulfilling some roles of research and advocacy as well right when they voice it in their stories and publish it and when it goes out that is advocacy in a sense if you think of it so part of this process in a lot of ways i would say that's that's how i look at the role of media so yeah and i think that's a break up of the kind of roles but like yash i think we were having this conversation and you would actually put down put it down pretty well if you ask me like really well about how exactly to think about a career and like there are a wide array of roles but there's certain principles that remain same across them right so yeah. why don't you just like help everyone out with this awesome uh, thanks sharan you know uh, over the past 3 years of actually more 5 years of trying to build a career here uh, i've noticed that there are four or five things which remain constant no matter which niche within policy you want to go to right and some i've learned over like for literally several hundreds of conversations with people that specific scan of course vary but there are some certain principle level things which remain constant right no matter what you're trying to do here uh i'll just and again as shang was mentioning we have a career magazine which we have put together which includes in a lot more depth what shang was just describing about the policy making process in india and where you can find your own fit but a lot of other write ups as well so do check it out uh, it's all on the website publicpolicyindia.com but coming back to what shang asked right uh I, there are five that i would like to share right now like i'll start with the first right skills of course elephant in the room uh, hmm. there was this tweet that i had seen the other day i think i shared with you which is one day the only jobs people will be will people will do will be jobs that only people can do right right 
right? So the it beautifully touch upon the human element of this field, just how much of a people's business this is, right? So, for example, when people ask me that you know what are the skills that you use to do the job that you do at Twitter, and and I tell them that ninety nine percent of it is communications, to be honest, right? Uh, I don't do coding, I don't do graphic design, although of course there are fields within policy that need these skills. Not to discount that at mm-hmm. all. But if in, if you're in in an evaluation evaluation role, you will need something like a Python, I'm assuming, right? If you're in a policy yeah. control, graphic design is a must have. But the point being, this remains by and large a space when you have to be good with people. And by that, I mean, you know, the soft skills. So something else, basically, how do you write an email? How do you communicate? How do you manage stakeholders? How do you manage your time? And so on and so forth, right? So it's just that. It's an entire people's business. There's the nature of the craft. Two types of skills, hard skills, soft skills, we've discussed. But hard skills, important, of course, but in a sense, easier to acquire and learn. Right, because there's, it's very definitive in that sense. Soft skills indispensable and critical right from the word go. Right. Second principle, just moving mm. away quickly, is what I say. You know, sample it out. So, mm. okay, this is how the this is how I look at the policy space. One is thematic focus areas. The other is skill space. In the sense, thematic is your health, education, gender, environment, and what have you. Skills basis, what kind of roles you want to work in. So, there's consulting, mm. project management, associate, research mm. analyst what have you, right? Two mm-hmm. parts of the tree. I would say be as strict as you can about the left side, which is the thematic focus area and as easy as you can on the right hand side, which is the skills base. So in the sense, mm-hmm. I want to be very sure that I want to work in education, but within education, I can work as a consultant as well as an associate as well as a project analyst as well. That's fine with me. Right. right. Uh, that's how I look at it. Like what have I have learned right. from the past few years and so just building on that, when I say sample it out, what I mean is before you take the plunge and decide what is it that you want to work on, right? Within this, in this mm-hmm. thematic focus area, you at least need to try out the others, right? So you want to make sure that you have given healthcare a chance, you've given gender a chance, you've given environment a chance before you settle mm-hmm. in on education. For example, if that is your jam, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because you, there's something you'll agree with, Shan, that a lot of the work that we do here also comes out of that sense of, you know, making a change or impact or passion or just mm. seeing that out there. Right. So all the more important. So just sample it out that take a, take a shot of different things. Right. Uh, mm. I often ask people, what is it that feels like play to you, but work to others. Right. This is one of my, one of the favorite things that I ask people, because if, if there's something that comes very easily and naturally to you, uh, that you do out of passion and, you know, that's, that's something that you might work on, even if nobody paid you to that probably is your competitive focus area, right? That probably is something that you want to double down on. There'll always be someone technically more skilled than you are. There's mm-hmm. definitely someone technically more skilled to do the job that I'm doing currently. I'm just being very honest, but yeah. can that person replicate my sense of passion for this role? I don't, I'm not sure. Right. This is that. So again, try out different things, intern, volunteer, do a project based gig, whatever it is. And of course, full-time job as well, but figure out that what is that one niche that you really want to work on, right? Third. hundred percent. Yeah. No, I agree. I, in fact, I think you compound at a much faster rate when you're enjoying what you're doing. It's yeah. what I tell a lot of people. Yeah. And I think this goes beyond just policy as well, right? It's like, if you're loving, let's say coding, you're going to do it 10 X better than anyone else. If not today, a year from now, because you're going yeah. to enjoy the working six, 15 hours a day while everyone else yeah. will be struggling eight hours a day. So, yeah. Oh, then it's a chore. So exactly. Yeah. Right? Third, show and don't tell. And mm. this is this is something I would love for you to tell you, share, sharing if you disagree with me on this, but it's one of those things I feel strongly about, which is this whole degree versus experience debate, right? Not much of a, it's not a versus debate. It's just that it's a question of timing and whatever. But my view on this is, is that people in the policy space, especially decision makers and those who are hiring, they care a lot more for the work you have done than the degree that you have. Uh, mm-hmm. I have had countless examples of where, in, say, in the final round of hiring, there was this guy with a simple B and then someone with like a double MPP. The guy with the mm-hmm. BA got in just because he had more work to show. As simple as that. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. I mean, uh, like, I don't want to name someone, but we know common friends, like people who are heads of public policy for multinational corporations in India who have a simple. Like, you know, BA from DU, no MPP, nothing. Right. right? So, yeah, so 
the point being that the policy space is kind of unique in the sense the stakeholders here really care more for the work you have done and the skills you have to show for more than the degree mm-hmm. that you might have. I am not saying that degree does not value or uh, does not have value does not matter. It is a question of it ties back into the previous point I was trying to make that unless mm-hmm. you have worked in the space, unless you have the sense of experience. Do you, are you really ready to make that humongous investment? Not just in terms of money, but the time, the two years that you'll not yeah. be working, right? So okay. again, the two points are interlinked. But please work in the field, get a sense of what it is that you truly like, where is it you might need that academic help or background, and then go for a master, yeah. right? Give yourself the time and opportunity. I agree with you to a certain extent, there, but there, I think that it really depends. So, so there are organizations, and I think we've had the. Uh, good fortune of working or meeting people who haven't cared so much about the degree as much as show yeah. uh, what kind of credentials you have, but there are spaces to enter where it becomes harder. So yeah. for example, in research, I think it's very important because in research, you're also building a knowledge base. Agreed. That's why PhDs are required to go over, uh, like yeah. really proceed over that. In advocacy, it does a lot you can learn on the role, right? In research, in fact, there's certain organizations where your growth might get stunted if you don't have a PhD, which is yeah. kind of unfortunate, but that's also because you're trying to find new answers to things that haven't even been thought of. Right. Yeah. So you really have to go into a depth that only you can only get from like higher education and PhDs. But I think those are roles are few and far, not necessarily the norm in policy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Especially on the bit that yes, there are niches, which, require degree as a mandate itself, even for you to get started. But again, by and large, in most other spaces, it's fine. In fact, it's good if you work first and then think of uh, specializing. Next is uh, spread the word, right? So you can Google this, but there's something, there's a concept known as surface area of luck, right? And I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm literally reading out from the first link of Google, which says that luck surface area is the amount of action that you take around your passion combined mm-hmm. with the number of people you communicate your passion to basically do good work but also don't fret from talking about it, right? The whole idea here is that, you know, uh, doing good work, work is important, but also being able to communicate the same is a big advantage because the policy space is still up and coming. People generally do mm-hmm. not have, you know, people, yeah, they don't have a zero sum mindset as long as yeah. there's a sense of awareness about what is it that you want to work on and you're passionate about it. And, you know, maybe you might need support with people are generally willing to chat, share, help out. Like I've had some of my, the best professional opportunities come my way, just because of, you know, just because a set of people were aware about my work, right. My passion right. and importantly, what is it that I was li- looking to make a switch to next, right. Like hmm. when I have had this conversation multiple times, right, Shang, that I tell you that, you know, I'm going to work in this and in the next 10 minutes, you tell me 200 options that, okay, you could do this, yeah. maybe this person is doing that. And it's just that, that if you're willing to communicate and share, right. In general, that maybe this is what you're working on or what you need help with or something it just helps out. So do good work but don't fret talking about it either. It can be in multiple ways, right? So maybe your LinkedIn, maybe you have a personal mm-hmm. website or what have you, anything else, right? Maybe, I don't know, you're tweeting about some of these things, whatever works the best for you. But the point is having that basic sense of presence online uh, in the age of the internet ensures that, you know, those things work for you even while you're asleep. Your work can be discovered yeah. even when you're not actively engaging with it, right? And you never know what opportunity that might put your way. So feel free to share beat skills. You might need be, you, you might be looking to acquire or a role you feel you should try out at some point. You never know what might come your way next. Right. And finally right. shun the competition. Now uh, there's something that I feel that isn't discussed at all, but it's surprising mm. how well it works. Okay. The policy space in India is in its infancy, still in its early right. days. We might feel that, yeah. yeah. but uh, there isn't really much that is linear about building a career in the sense, for example, in the US, right? Someone wanting to build a career in the policy space might have some semblance of probable career path, say between a senator's mm-hmm. office or campaigning for a congresswoman who's up for election or, you know, interning at a state capital or working at an advocacy firm. In India, a lot of right. these are still up and coming roles and verticals, right? With limited awareness, still evolving scope of engagement and opportunities, at least as of today, right? But mm-hmm. this is an advantage as well as a disadvantage. Disadvantage because there's a lack of a set path, so to speak, right? That one can follow yeah. uh, and fall back on for reference out of university. But advantage is in the sense that you can chart a course of your own, right? With minimal hindrance or cookie cutter approaches that you can be compared to. The point being that if you reach out to an individual or an institution today, yeah, an opportunity to maybe intern with them or volunteer with the organization, right? And from a mm-hmm. viewpoint of adding value to the work they're doing already, there's a genuinely high chance that you might hear back and land that opportunity. There are 
every time there's an opening in this country in general, right? 200,000 people apply for it maybe, right? And that's okay. A lot of it generally comes down to luck. If you apply to only the jobs which exist already, I'm saying hmm. that why not create opportunities for yourself? Reach out to people, 100%. write hmm. to them that, Hey, you do this work. I want to work with you. It's not a crime you're committing at, at, at a maximum. You have nothing to lose, but five kilobytes of data, I guess. Like yeah. fine, right? at max, someone will not reply back. Even if you send like 20 emails and four people reply, that's an insanely high response rate, to be honest, right? Yeah. <laughs> figure out individuals or institutions you want to work with and write to them. And if you get that opportunity, number one, you will, you won't be competing with like hundreds of thousands of others, I guess, but, mm -hmm. but also, you know, that sense of connect will remain that this person had reached out. I gave it a chance and this worked out well, and you'll always have the sense of mentorship guidance or what have you, right. And expand your network. So, so shun the competition in that sense that please apply to roles, which exists already, which are passionate about, of course, right. If there's a mm -hmm. job opening, you want to work there, apply, nobody's saying a no, but in certain stages, especially if you're in college and looking to, you know, get those internships and even full-time jobs, maybe feel free to reach out right, to people. It's underrated. Yeah. No, hundred percent. And I think uh, what, like some of the things you mentioned, like, like in policy, yes, they'll work. I think that just in general, no matter what career path you're taking, yeah. write to people. I've done it so many times over my career. I've managed to get on calls with unicorn founders. This, yeah. Now the unicorns. <laughs> Back then they won't. I was just like, all right, I like what you're doing. Let's have a chat. Yes. Uh, work out. Uh, I have so many people doing that with me as well. Like on a daily basis, I get multiple emails from people saying, hey, I want to intern with Chase. Uh, we, they may not have openings. Like sometimes we're just we're full on capacity, but I try and make sure I respond to them at least and be like, okay, you keep me, you keep me in the, you remember to follow up with me in this month. And then maybe I might have an opportunity then. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, as long as it's on, it's on their radar because I'm the most forgetful person, they might get a shot, you know? So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's, you know, the space is so fast evolving, Sharon, that the specifics and the journey for everyone will be wildly different, I feel. Uh, yeah. But if you have some of these principles in mind, honestly, it's easy to build a career and a thriving one at that. So, that's just oh, yeah. uh, wanted to put together. Anything you want to add before we close this? Uh, nothing i think uh, there's a lot i think the handbook if i'll call it handbook or career yeah. magazine is what you're yeah. probably calling it right yeah. yeah i think i'll have a lot more information and of course like i hope there will be certain things you would have forgotten also i mean like policy is vast there are certain niches where i i genuinely won't have had any had any oversight but we've tried to get you as much of yeah. everything as much as we could possibly do that yeah this is very helpful, Sharang. And for all our audiences, the career magazine, as well as, you know, link to Sharang's LinkedIn profile that please look him up and, you know, feel free to reach out to him. All of it will be in the show notes. Uh, and we look forward to hearing back from you in the comments that maybe whom can we invite next? What is it that we should discuss next or take up next uh, in these conversations? Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Th and thank you, Sharang. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.